ships preparing to collect the material have changed course to return to Cyprus for refuelling. BBC News. You're listening to BBC Radio 4. Now for the first in a new series, here's Helen Castor and her guests making history. Today, a question you might think doesn't need asking. Where was the Great War? And we're in Plymouth to hear the remarkable tale of an 18th century millwright who took on a life or death gamble in the attempt to become our first submariner. We've enlisted two of our brightest and clearest minds to help us explore these topics. From the University of Cambridge, the archaeologist and broadcaster Dr Carenza Lewis, and with me here in the studio, Professor Emma Griffin of the University of East Anglia, author of Liberty's Dawn, A People's History of the Industrial Revolution. We begin in the 10th century, with a conflict so brutal that a generation later it was still referred to as the Great War. Its culminating confrontation has gone down in history as the Battle of Brunanburh, and in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle there's a poem that recounts the bloody action. Never before this were more men in this island slain by the sword's edge, as books and aged sages confirm. Since Angles and Saxons sailed here from the east, sought the Britons over the wide seas, since those warsmiths hammered the Welsh, and earls, eager for glory, overran the land. The commanders overseeing the carnage on one side were Athelstan, first king of the English, and his half-brother, the future King Edmund. And on the other, a northern alliance led by Olaf, the Viking king of Dublin, and his allies, Constantine, king of the Scots, and Owen, king of Strathclyde. This defeat for the Vikings was a blood and gut scrap that some scholars have regarded as the beginning of Englishness. But it's also a historical and geographical headache. Because although the battle is mentioned in more than 50 medieval sources, there's still no agreement about where the action took place. Over the years, locations have been suggested all the way from Dumfriesshire to Devon. Not for nothing are these known as the Dark Ages. But since 2004, thanks largely to scientists and place name experts at Nottingham University, the idea has developed that Brunanburh might really be Bromborough on the Wirral, between the rivers Mersey and Dee. We'll hear why in a moment. But a recent paper in the Yorkshire Archaeological Journal by top 10th century historian Michael Wood makes the case for relocating the battlefield across the Pennines to Yorkshire. Before we let Michael have his say, here he is setting out the political background to Brunanburh, an analysis that, thankfully, nearly everyone agrees with. This is an incredibly dramatic time in the history of the British Isles. You know, if you were somebody in your 50s or 60s, you would have seen Alfred the Great's desperate struggle for survival against the Vikings. You had three bitter wars. You would have seen his son and daughter establish a kingdom of the Anglo-Saxons south of the Humber. And then in 927, Athelstan invades Northumberland and for the first time creates a kingdom of all England. And of course the Northumbrians deeply resent rule by the southerners. But and here's the crucial thing. That same summer of 927, Athelstan goes on to force the submission of all the kings of the British Isles. And when the Scots resist him in 934, he sends an army, leads an army, all the way up into Morrisshire. Three years later, 937, Constantine, king of the Scots, draws his allies together, Strathclyde Welsh, King Anlaf Guthrison of Dublin, uh, Northumbrians, and in 937 autumn, all these allies join together and invade England. The ensuing war, even 40 or 50 years later, was known to the man in the street as the Great War. The climactic battle was at a place called Brunambur, and nobody knows where Brunambur was. Michael Wood. To hear what's become the historical orthodoxy in recent years about the site of this epic battle, Tom Holland went first to the Wirral. You may remember that an exciting public history project a few years ago used DNA to establish that there was a Viking Norse community there, directly across the Irish Sea from the one in Dublin that was involved in the Battle of Brunanburh. 
Professor Steve Harding from the University of Nottingham is a Wirral native, and as a biological scientist, he worked on that groundbreaking history. Right, Tom, we're actually at a place called Bebbington Heath, which is on the outskirts of Bromborough. Bromborough is the modern name for the old place name Brunnenborough. Is that the only example we have of a place name basically called Brunnenborough? Yes, the contemporary Old English poem, which describes the battle, mentions only three places. One is Brunnenborough, of course, where the battle took place. Another is Dublin, where the escaping Norse fleet escaped back to. And the other place it mentions is, is Dingersmere, uh, which is where the, the Norsemen departed from, disgraced in spirit, back to Dublin. And in some research that we did a few years ago, we believe that we've also identified the Dingsmere place. I was looking at a map of Wirral, and then I saw Thingwall, and I thought, surely it can't be Things Mere, the mere, the water, waterway of the thing. So I rang up the English Place Name Society and my colleague Paul Cavill, and I said, Paul, uh, I think I've got an idea where this Dingsmere place may be, but it's, it's too obvious, it, it just can't be true. He said, well, actually, Steve, uh, you might be right there. And, and um, a thing, what is a, a, a thing? A thing is the name of the, the Norse Assembly or Parliament. And so what is a Norse Assembly doing on the Wirral? 35 years prior to the battle, there was a large settlement of Norsemen who'd been expelled from Ireland. And we know they were here because of all the place names. So the Norsemen coming over in 937 would be well familiar with this area. So this would provide, if you like, an ideal beachhead. Are there any mentions in contemporary or near contemporary sources that would enable us to nail this thesis? No, they just tell us it's, it's Brunnenbrook. But there are historians who dispute the fact that there are no clues within the contemporary or near contemporary sources as to the possible location of the battle. One of those is Michael Wood. You know, a historian's job is to use all the sources, the totality of the evidence, landscape, philology, place names, texts, coins, everything. It's only with the secondary sources that a story emerges. In the 12th century, chronicler in Worcester, using older chronicles from York, says that the fleet landed in the Humber. Two sources, one English and one Irish, say that the Allies were helped by Danes living within England. That means either Northumbria or the East Midlands. It couldn't be the Wirral. No, no. Norse settlement it, it, there. The Wirral's so negligible in this, and they're not Danes, they're Norse there. We're talking about Danes living in England. Danes. And the crucial source, recorded in the 12th century, but paraphrasing a 10th century poem, says that the Northumbrians gave willing submission to the invaders. This is absolutely crucial, because what it's telling you is that, you know, the invasion came in the Humber, and that the Northumbrians, near or in the, the region, of York went with the invaders. All the wars that are fought between the Southern English and the Northumbrians with their Irish allies in the period of 25 years up to the 950s are fought on the Great North Road south of York through Castleford, Doncaster, down into the five boroughs of Derby, Nottingham and so on. So that's the axis of war. If you're going to argue it was in the Wirral, you've got to explain how a Scottish army ended up in the Wirral. But what about the suggestion that Thingwall, which is in the Wirral, that that is name-checked in the poem that features in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. The Anglo-Saxon poem on Brunambur has a phrase saying that after their defeat, the Norse-Irish set sail on Dingus Mira back to Ireland. The proponents of the Wirral have argued that this doesn't say Dingusmere, that it's a fur, that it's Thingusmere, the mere of the thing, the, the, the local assembly, and that this can be associated with a place name in the Wirral called Thingwall. And it's so historically and topographically unlikely that even though I'm not a philologist, I thought, uh, let's just check this out. And I asked four leading experts on Anglo-Saxon poetry what they thought of this, and everybody agrees that the translation of this phrase, which is in the authoritative dictionary of the Anglo-Saxon language as the loud-sounding sea, as a poetic phrase for the loud-sounding sea, is the correct 
the meaning of that phrase. It's, it's not a place name at all. But actually, one key piece of evidence in favour of the Wirral is that we know the Vikings are coming from Dublin, and Dublin is much closer to the Wirral than it is to the Humber. Well, two points on that. First of all, uh, the Northumbrians are part of the alliance, the Strathclyde Welsh are part of the alliance, and the Scots are part of the alliance. Secondly, the landing in the Humber fits with what we know about the operation of Viking fleets. You're sailing from Dublin. You don't leave your fleet on the coast of Lancashire. Vikings don't like being separated from their fleets. And the sea route around the north of Scotland in the summer, when they're sailing, is perfectly easy. So it's a false argument to suggest that just because the Wirral is opposite Dublin, they should have fought there. And an interesting piece of additional evidence to this is that, uh, you know, the, if the battle was fought, let's say, in November, some, maybe November, 937, uh, you're a day and a half sailing away from Dublin, but the return of the fleet isn't noted till the following spring. That's Mike Wood making the case for uh, Yorkshire, but Steve, we are still here on the outskirts of Bromborough. This Humber theory really came from from John of Worcester, the 12th century historian. It's not mentioned before that. It's not mentioned in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. But then the I suppose the, the, the problem is, is is that this isn't mentioned either in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, is it? So so there's a problem on both sides. Well, the place Dingersmere is mentioned. So we would argue that the waterway near here is in the Anglo-Saxon poem. Professor Stephen Harding and Michael Wood crossing swords over the location of the Great War of 937. Carenza Lewis in Cambridge, would it be too simple to define this debate as a clash between science on the one hand and historical sources on the other? Well, in a way, it would be a shame if that was how it was defined, because what it really needs is teamwork between those sources. We don't have the definite science really known, really, of any Anglo-Saxon battle, so we don't really know what they look like. And the way the process works is that the historical text will give us a question, if you like, where was the Battle of Brunanburgh, to take an example, and then the archaeological investigation will test as to whether one particular candidate site is that site or not. Somewhere like the Battle of Bosworth, for example, it's relatively recent that we've really been very confident as to exactly where that was, and that's a classic example of a combination of historical evidence telling us about um, the approximate location of the battle and then archaeological evidence being able to go out with metal detectorists and recover the lead shot and even the little silver boar which is the emblem of Richard III that appears to have come from the edge of a marsh that may be where his horse fell in. That is a lot of evidence that says yes this does look like the Battle of Bosworth. Um, e Emma Griffin, modern historians must look at this kind of historical black hole with a sort of incomprehension but in your period do you still face problems really relating to sources, whether gaps in them or perhaps too many. The idea of not knowing where a battle took place is, is, as you say, incomprehensible for a modern historian. But we do, of course, still have all manner of historical problems that we just can't answer. So one of the things I've been teaching this term, for example, is the Jack the Ripper case, which has probably generated more historical interest than anything else from the 19th century. And yet we still don't know anything about who the person was, and we're not even really certain who exactly were the people that he killed. And although forensics are starting to move in, we still don't get any closer to an answer because it's very unlikely that the right kind of evidence was collected. So I think these problems of unanswerable historical questions, of course, apply to every time and every place. It's the stuff of history, and this is Making History on BBC Radio 4. Now